adopted anywhere in the world at this point. And uh, let me just tell you what our, so I'm sorry, I forgot. My name is Pierre Dussauge, and I will be one of the main instructors in the videos that you'll see. So by the time you're done, you'll be sick and tired of seeing my face all the time. And uh, we have Amandine Fagot here, who will be taking care of lots of uh, our connections, our interactions, and who will be helping us out overall in, in the program. And there are other people that you will meet along the way, but maybe I'll let that come when, when the time comes. So our uh, agenda for today, I'll tell you who's signed up for the program uh, in this uh, current uh, edition, so that you see who you are working with. I'll give you an overview of the program, remind you what the certification requirements are, just so we're all in line. And we'll do a very, we'll try to discuss a very simple mini case, but hopefully you'll find that there's some intriguing lessons that we can learn from it. And we'll try to introduce the first two weeks of the program. And I guess in a couple of weeks we will have a webinar anyway to keep going. And then, of course, if you have any questions, uh, we can discuss them. And uh, Amandine and I will tell you what the next steps are for the program. So there are 73 participants signed up for the current program. Uh, we always have this problem in management education. Less women than there are men. It should be more women than men if we believe uh, demographics, but I guess that's it. Um, a pretty broad age distribution. Makes me feel old, but there's not much I can do. And um, 63% of you work in a company as an, as a, as an employee of a company. 18% are self-employed. We do have a few students and people who are, I guess, neither uh, of the above categories. Um, you come from a number of different locations. 47 participants come from Europe. 22 participants come from Africa. We have two participants from uh, the Americas, so I guess in this case it is good morning. Uh, and uh, even two participants from uh, the Middle East or uh, the Asia Pacific region. That's who you are. Um, so what is the program made up of? Uh, we'll actually talk a little bit more about what this means, but our first course is on what we call business strategy. It starts today and will go all the way till the beginning of April. Then we'll enter a different facet of strategy, which is what we call corporate strategy, from April to almost the end of May. And we will end the overall program with a third course, which is on what we call strategy implementation. And as you will see as we go along, it's a very poor name, but that is the, the normal uh, label that is put on, on, this, um, on, on this topic. Um, I guess an important date to remember is that every Wednesday new material for the coming week is uh, uploaded, is available online. This includes videos which are short little lecturettes on, online on different topics of the course and how hopefully they tie together. But also a few tests, quizzes that allows you to test directly what you understand, what you don't, uh, what makes sense, what doesn't make sense. And some broader exercises, uh, articles, other material that is made available on, on each of the topics. And the exams for the course include true-false questions, so it's easy. You have a 50% chance of getting the right answer even with no clue about it. And also a few open-ended questions, some mini case studies and other kinds of application of what we're, we're talking about. And uh, I guess what is interesting here is some of the evaluation is done by yourselves. So you will be asked to evaluate other people's answers with some guidelines, but it's also a way to see how 
both you think, how others think, and how we can try to converge towards a better understanding of some of these concepts. The requirements for the certification is that you pass all three courses. So it means at least uh, 70 out of 100 total possible points on each of the courses. I don't think you'll find it too difficult, right, Amandine? Um, and as well, a minimum score in the final test, which is proctored and that you can take anywhere, again, in the world, but in a particular location in which the test will be set up. So just to fill in the final grade, each of the course exams will account for 10% of the final grade, and the, the final exam, the proctored exam, which is on the entire program, the three courses, the content of the three courses, is the other 70%. So let's get into our, our main topic for today. What I'd like to try to us, for us to discuss is what does thinking strategically mean? How can we, what are some of the issues that we need to, um, to raise, that we need to be able to position to know how to think about strategy in a, in a consistent way and in a, a relevant way. So I'm going to show you a few people and maybe you can help me identify who they are. You may be a little bit surprised, but uh, you'll see that there is a thread running into these different people, and we'll try to find out what it is. The first one is very easy. Oh, I'm sorry, I went ahead of myself. Uh, this is actually to try to get you to think about the various courses. Uh, does anyone know what this is? Or am I the only old enough person in this room to know what it is? This is actually the very first computer that I ever bought. It is the first Macintosh that Apple produced. It looks very old now, but when I bought it, I thought it was so modern. And as you know, Apple has come up with a new version, and this is what the latest Macintoshes look like. This is the very first iPhone, and this is iPhone 7. I stopped at iPhone 7, not by chance, but uh, for a good reason, is that as Apple was coming out with iPhone 7, they also announced that they were starting something called Apple Pay. So I'd like you to think about why Apple goes from producing the first Mac to this Mac and others in the future. Why Apple goes from the first iPhone to iPhone 7, and as you know now, it's iPhone 8, iPhone 10. Um, and I'd like you to also think, why is it that Apple goes from producing computers to producing phones and to producing Apple Pay? And if we think about it, there are two very different logics at work here. The reason why they have to go from one Mac to increasingly modern and updated and innovative versions of what is fundamentally the same business is because if they stayed here, what would happen? They would go bankrupt. Nobody would buy an old Mac. Why? Because on the market, there are much better alternatives than the very old Mac. So what drives Apple to go from here to here is competition. In the same way, what drives Apple to go from here to here is competition. What drives Apple to go from computers to phones is very different. There's no obligation to be able to continue competing in computers to produce phones. And there's no obligation when you produce phones, you could continue competing in phones, to get into payment systems. So there's a very different logic. One is governed by competition and the incentives or the, the drive it creates in companies. Another is a much more open choice that companies have, which is today, to say, today I'm in a particular business area, but tomorrow I can choose to also be in different business areas. In the same way, uh, and this is just another illustration, Microsoft went from the very first operational version of Windows, there was a previous one, 
But this is the first one that more or less worked and actually allowed people who had a normal PC to get some of the functionalities that they could get from an Apple computer. And they radically improved it when they went to what is called Windows 95, then Windows 98, then Windows XP. And I'll stop at Windows XP because pretty much the same month that Windows XP came out, Microsoft came out with this thing. And uh, some of you, I'm sure, are young enough to know what it is. I can only know it through my children. Uh, but it's the Xbox, which is a video game console. It's a very different business. This is hardware when Microsoft for years was in software. This is a consumer product when an operating system is primarily a business-to-business -business product. Um, and what forces Windows to move to the right is the threat of competition. What makes Microsoft go from software to video game consoles is totally different. It's a much more open choice. They could have started making automobiles or uh, organizing cruises. We can imagine anything. And again, it's a different logic that presides over these different choices. In some cases, it can be even a little bit more surprising. This is what is called an HP NV14. And now there are more modern versions, but I stopped at the 14 because the same month that HP introduced the NV14, they also decided that they would break up the company into two entities that are totally independent from each other, actually have different shareholders. One uses the name HP, so only the initials of the founders. There's no reference to Mr. Hewlett or Mr. Packard anymore. And this company actually continues producing the hardware that HP used to do, so PCs, printers, and so on. And another company, which is totally different, which is totally separate now. There's, they're not even sister companies. And uh, this is called Hewlett Packard Enterprise. So no reference to the initials, but only to the names of the founders. And Hewlett Packard Enterprises offers services, basically uh, services uh, like uh, um, uh, a lot of it was part of EDS, if I'm not mistaken. And they offer sort of business services in terms of organization, in terms of IT, and uh, support systems for, uh, for large companies. And I would like to argue the reason why HP has to come out with newer versions of the Envy uh, PC laptop is because of competition. The reason why Hewlett Packard decides to break up into two independent companies has very little to do with competition but has something to do with what the company thinks it can achieve at a more uh, general level, at a more aggregate level. And basically what we've just talked about is the difference between the two first courses in our program. One is what we'll call business strategy. And business strategy looks at one particular business and tries to understand how competition takes place in that business. So if you're looking at handheld cell phones, Apple competes with Huawei, competes with uh, Samsung, competes with uh, a number of other companies. And they have to decide within this business what to do to try to achieve at least equal performance to their main competitors and hopefully better performance in their competitors. And that's why I've tried to symbolize it with a sumo uh, fight, because sumos are supposed to stay within this circle. If they get pushed out of the circle, they've lost. And basically, business strategy is within the confines of any particular business or industry. And so if you make automobiles, why do you make automobiles that are better? that sell for a higher price, that have a lower cost, that generate more profitability than the automobiles that are manufactured by your competitors. If you make computers, same thing. If you're an airline, why are you a better airline? Again, from a performance point of view, 
not necessarily as seen by the customers, that's a different story, in this business. So it's business strategy is we define the business first and then we try to see why some firms outperform others. Corporate strategy, on the contrary, assumes that business strategy is taken care of by managers who are in charge of a particular business. And the question for the company now is what is the right scope that we should have? How broad should that scope be? So for example, Microsoft has decided that being in software was not enough and they've decided to expand their scope not only to video games but even to the hardware that is used to play video games. Apple decided that being a PC maker was not enough and they've expanded their business to cell phones and they've expanded their business to tablets, they've expanded their business to a number of other areas and in our slide even to payment systems because they have created this thing called Apple Pay. Um, many companies, I feel like saying every company, tends to expand its business. It can be in a very related way, it can be in a totally unrelated way in businesses that have nothing to do with one another. So business strategy is how to compete in one particular business. Corporate strategy is why does it make sense to assemble a number of different businesses and we will argue even a number of different markets together. So you're selling, I don't know, a company like L'Oréal sells cosmetics in Europe and at one point they decided to go to China and China is now one of their largest markets. But beauty codes are very different in China from what they are in Europe. Uh, biological characteristics of the customers are different in China than they are in Europe and now one of the main markets that L'Oréal is targeting is Africa and in Africa again biological characteristics are different and uh, cultural preferences are different, what we call beauty is different and so one of the questions is why does it make sense for L'Oréal to do this? Why wouldn't it be better for a Chinese company to actually produce the best cosmetics for the Chinese market in which case L'Oréal should stay in Europe? So when we talk about expanding the scope, it's both the business scope and the geographic scope of the company. So I'm going to primarily focus on business strategy from now on today. Uh, the first course, so until the end of April, beginning of April, is on business strategy. The second course will be more specifically on corporate strategy. It raises different issues. It raises different frameworks, different questions that we should ask ourselves. Of course, there's a link between the two, but these are two very different aspects. And strategy implementation I will keep for a little bit later, but I'll talk, I'll talk about it in a, few, in a few moments. So this is the gentleman I wanted you to recognize. I think that's an easy one, right? And I hope everyone online knows that we are looking at the current president of the US. Um, but we're absolutely not interested in this gentleman as the president in, of the US. We're interested because this gentleman, who doesn't talk about it very much, was the largest shareholder of an airline, which happened to be called Trump Airlines. As you can imagine, if he doesn't talk about it very much, he is not known for being particularly shy or modest. So if he doesn't talk about it very much, is that he probably doesn't have good things to say about the outcome. And indeed, Trump Airlines didn't do very well and was eventually sold off. And I'm sorry, I can't resist. I found this online and I just think it summarizes. So the legend is that Trump wanted to make Trump Airlines into a luxury airline. And uh, according to rumors, I haven't checked, he insisted that the bathrooms be fitted with marble which in an airplane is not a great idea and maybe there was too much marble in this airplane and the front wheel didn't resist, I don't know. Let's see, now another gentleman. Who is this gentleman? He is actually a former Formula One champion. His name is Niki Lauda and why is he here? 
not because we're interested in Formula One in the same way as we're not interested in US presidents, but because he started an airline called Lauda Air. Another gentleman, and this is more difficult, not very fashionable these days, what with the Weinstein affair, but uh, this is a gentleman here. I'll give you a better picture, and we're getting close, closer to one of his businesses. This gentleman is uh, an Indian citizen called Vijay Malia, and uh, he was until recently the chairman of the largest spirits and beer company in India. Uh, knowing that India has 1.3, I think, uh, billion people, uh, there's a lot of beer being consumed, even if many Indians do not drink alcohol. Um, and so he was a very rich person. And uh, this was the motto, the brand of beer that he, is, that he owns is called Kingfisher. This is what it looks like. I always thought the taste of India was curry, but apparently it could be different. And why is he here? You probably guessed, because there, there was an airline called Kingfisher Airline, and it wasn't exactly a small-scale airline, because it actually ordered, I think, close to a dozen Airbus A380s, so quite a significant investment. And unfortunately, it has not been very successful. And Mr. Vijay Malia now is living in London and uh, cannot go back to India, immediately at least. Uh, there are a number of minority shareholders and creditors that do not think that he did a perfect job in Kingfisher. Do you know who this gentleman is? Richard Branson is one of the richest individuals in the UK. And you probably get an airline called Virgin Airlines that still exists, but in which he is no longer the majority shareholder. And I guess having learned from his experience better than some of the others I showed you, he said there is only one way of becoming a millionaire by investing in an airline start out as a billionaire. What does this mean? It means that it's very difficult to make money in the airline business. It's very difficult to have good performance when you operate an airline. And actually, uh, I guess as shareholders of a state-owned airline for many years, we should know because we've paid several billion euros to keep Air France alive. Um, and it's exactly the same story. But of course, there are a few airlines that seem to do well. So one is Ryanair, very good financial performance. Another is another airline in Asia that's called Air Asia, and it has made a Malaysian gentleman called Tony Fernandez a billionaire. So at least that gentleman has proven um, uh, Richard Branson wrong. And there is a similar case or example in China as well. And uh, the prototype or the model of all these airlines is actually an airline called Southwest Airlines. And uh, Southwest Airlines has pretty remarkable performance. I'd like to show you. This is their stock price over the last close to 40 years. So I went back as far as I could, 1980. Uh, it's a log scale which means that it underestimates the real increase in stock price with ups and downs like any stock, but clearly they've done quite well. This is Southwest, the blue line, what we've just seen, but at an older date because I can't update it and we'll see why in just a second, compared to uh, another airline that the initials start with AA, you probably can imagine what it is, it's American Airlines, which is one of the largest airlines in the world, actually. Right? And uh, the reason why I can't update it is because American Airlines filed for bankruptcy, or what is called Chapter 11 in, American, uh, in the American system, which is protection against creditors, and it allows the company to restructure and restart uh, by wiping off some of the debt or deferring the payment of the debt, and so on and so forth. And uh, so if I wanted the stock price of American Airlines, I'd only have a very short segment, which is once they re-enter the stock market after they exit Chapter 11. 
And as you can see, Southwest is doing reasonably well when American Airlines is basically going out of business. And uh, a few years earlier, that's why Yahoo had not yet made their nice charts. This is DAL, you may guess, is Delta Airlines. And in the same way, Delta Airlines, again, is one of the largest airlines in the US. And uh, they are going bankrupt when Southwest is still doing reasonably well with a pretty good performance, as you can see with the, um, uh, with the percentages on the left. This is actually a, a summary. This is Southwest, and this light blue line, I'm sorry it's not contrasted enough, is actually the, the uh, airline index in the US stock market. So it's an average of the stock price of all airlines that are publicly traded in the US. And as you can see, Southwest clearly outperforms the industry in which it operates. La last point, which is, uh, what is this? Ah, this is, excuse me, this is the airline index. This is Delta Airlines since, excuse me, I got it all wrong. This is Delta Airlines since they came out of bankruptcy, which means that they were able to restructure. They should be much stronger than an airline that has accumulated debt and so on. And even after that, Delta is not doing better than Southwest. This is the airline index, and this is Southwest, as you can see. Uh, thank you. Um, Southwest clearly outperforms its own industry. This is anecdotal, but maybe you can tell what this is. Obviously, a dramatic event that hurt the stock price of airlines, aside from other things. And as you can tell by the date, it's September 2001, and more specifically, September 11. And immediately when the stock market reopened after the September 11 events, the stock, the average stock of airlines dropped by about 60%. And somehow investors believe that Southwest is going to bounce back much more rapidly. And finally, this is Southwest compared to the Standard & Poor's 500, which represents the, at least the established economy. And as you can see, Southwest outperforms the economy quite dramatically, which if we believe Richard Branson should not happen because it's a worse industry than most others, yet Southwest can still outperform the industry. Which raises a number of questions, and I'm going to ask you to think about it which is why has Southwest been so successful for so long? All these numbers are over 40 plus years, which immediately raises a second question which is critical in strategy and without which we can't answer this first question, which is why has no other competitor copied Southwest successfully? In 40 years you can figure out what's going on. I hope you will agree that we figure it out in a few minutes, and we can try to think about why this might affect what Southwest wants to do going into the future, and we can talk more about it. So I do have a question for not only you, but also people online. Have you had time to look at the video that was posted earlier today? All right, so I'm sorry it's a video that lasts about 10 minutes, but uh, it gives us the point of view of the managers of Southwest, and in particular the founder of Southwest, who was then the CEO. The video is a little bit old, it dates back to the 90s, but a lot of what is said in the video, the numbers are, are updated in the written version of the case, which those of you who are online also have in the online documents for the course. Um, but it gives us the substance of what Southwest has been doing for the last 40 years. So maybe we can look at the video, then I'll give you three minutes to look at the case, and we can try to see what, what we can make of it. So I will go here. C'est moi qui actionne. If you talk to people who spend a lot of time on airplanes, they'll tell you with a straight face that flying has never been more dependable. What you can depend on are crowded airports, long flight delays, and service that's not what it used to be. But there is one company that's unique. Dallas-based Southwest Airlines is not only a leader in on-time performance and safety, 
Je suis pas faire. Pardon, c'est près de It's 9.30 a.m. somewhere over the Texas Hill Country, and Herb Kelleher is serving breakfast. Ladies, you are dying for a peanut. <laughs> it's not your normal breakfast, but then Southwest is not a normal airline. And Herb Kelleher, whose successes are studied at business schools from Harvard to Stanford, is not a normal chief executive officer. I will bet you one thing, that I'm the only airline president in America that would go over to his maintenance hangar at 2 o'clock in the morning in a flowered hat with a feathered bow up and a purple dress. <laughs> what school of management is this? <laughs> I think it's a school of management by fooling around, <laughs> is what it is. But Herb Kelleher is nobody's fool. For 16 straight years now, through energy crises and recessions, Southwest has turned a profit a record unmatched by any of its larger competitors. Now the 10th largest carrier in America, it's on the verge of becoming a billion dollar company, a major airline, and it succeeded by breaking all the rules. When we started out, we said, we're going to have a special niche in the industry, and if we're going to make it a really distinctive niche, we have to do things innovatively, and so we did. This is filet of peanut. Is your first class meal? There are no first class meals on Southwest, no meals at all in fact, and no first class. There aren't even assigned seats. It would slow down the operation. Two out of three Southwest flights are back on their way in 15 minutes or less, bound for their final destination. Unlike other airlines, Southwest doesn't have a hub. All of its service is point to point between 32 cities. If you're flying from San Antonio to El Paso, you go to El Paso nonstop. We don't route you through Dallas or route you through Houston. And so it is a more convenient type of service, but you have to have very low costs in order to be able to provide it. And Southwest's costs are the lowest in the business. The boarding passes are plastic and reusable. The tickets look like grocery store receipts. It's the only national carrier that doesn't blow into a computer reservation system, a savings of $25 million a year. You'd think that might present a problem for passengers making connections or transferring bags from other airlines. But it's no problem at all. Southwest doesn't make connections with other airlines. Isn't that inconvenient? We don't sell interline. We don't do it because it inconveniences the passengers to whom we are primarily dedicated, the short haul uh, frequent flyer that does not want to be held up in a ticket line for 30 minutes or be on the phone uh, getting a busy signal for 30 minutes while some other passenger is trying to arrange a very detailed, very time-consuming interline journey, uh, getting reservations on two or three other carriers and the best fare deal. What Southwest passengers do get is fairly simple. Flights that leave on time and are frequent enough for a businessman to have breakfast in Dallas, lunch in Houston, an afternoon meeting in Austin, and be back home for supper. They also get the lowest fares in the industry. In nearly every market, there are one-way fares for just $19. Southwest Airlines' success with respect to pricing is founded on the theory that you charge the lowest possible fare to develop the greatest possible volume. And that we compete with ground transportation, not other airlines. We got to the point in the Dallas-San Antonio market back in the 1970s where Braniff's standard coach fare was $62. And our pleasure class fare, the evening and weekend fare, was $15. Well, of course, shareholders would write in and say, we've noticed this discrepancy. Don't you think you have the latitude to increase your fare to $18 or $20 against $62? We'd say, no, you don't understand the philosophy on which we're built. In other words, $15 is what it costs to drive the car. Yeah, less than it costs to drive the car, exactly. When Herb, Lamar Muse, and Rollin King began Southwest Airlines 18 years ago, the competition, Braniff and Texas International, waged an unsuccessful three-year legal battle to kill them all. Southwest Airlines would like to welcome you to Dallas Knoxfield, our home. When Southwest's first flight finally got off the ground, there was $148 in the bank and a need to get people's attention. Remember what it was like before Southwest Airlines? You didn't have hats, you didn't have pants. Remember? 
With four planes and an idea, Southwest would not only change the industry, it would change the state of Texas. With the monopoly of Love Field in the middle of Dallas, Southwest found a home and a strategy. It became the Love Airline. Plus one thing no other airline can ever offer. Me. Remember? This may all look a bit sexist now, but this was 1971. Remember? Southwest went out to hire flight attendants with long legs, big personalities, and as Texas Monthly put it, looked like they all graduated from the same West Texas high school. And if you're still drinking, Paula Phillips, Mary Goins, and Deborah Franklin were among the first hired, and those early flights were never born. And then we had Transylvania for Halloween, and all the men we would make as Count Dracula's different ones we choose, and they wear the little teeth and the blood, and they wear that off the airplane. You, know? <laughs> you could tell immediately when anyone would get on the airplane, they would unwind, mm -hmm. definitely. Because uh, we would. I don't know, it was like something was always going on, the airplane, games, anything from who has the biggest hole in your sock contest. How many people can you get in the bathroom? This ice is kind of a bunchy. Almost overnight, air traffic in the market Southwest served doubled and tripled, a trend that has continued as the airline has expanded. In every city they've gone to, other airlines flying the same routes. They've been forced to drop their prices in order to compete with Southwest. I'm a soft sell guy, and if I catch you on another airline, I'll kill you. <laughs> Go ahead and laugh, but some of his competitors think Herb is not kidding. One of them is Ed Bovet, president of America West. How would you characterize the competition between you and Southwest? Very tenacious, very tenacious. Probably the most tenacious confrontation in the country. How does it differ, let's say, in the competition between TWA and America? TWA doesn't try to drive American out of business, nor does American try to drive TWA out of business. Southwest tries to drive America West out of business. That's not the case. That's really not the case. Uh, if we were, we would have. The main battleground is Phoenix, where the two carriers have gone after each other with everything from cutthroat fares to television commercials. America West struck first, implying that Southwest passengers were embarrassed to be seen flying on a chintzy airline. America West Airlines asks, why are these passengers covering up for their airline? Herb countered with this. If you're embarrassed to fly the airline with the fewest customer complaints in the country, Southwest will give you this back. If, on the other hand, Southwest is your kind of airline, we'll still give you this bag for all the money you'll save flying with us. The competition between the two carriers has reduced the unrestricted fare from Phoenix to Los Angeles to $36. And on the nine routes where the two compete, America West claims Southwest is absorbing 30 to $40 million in annual losses in order to win the war. We're in his way. In other words, I don't think it's anything personal. He wants the West. He wants to establish his route system in Phoenix. And as soon as we vanish, he can do that because those fares would go up and the payoff would be very big. The payoff on this war is very big, very, very big. Herb scoffs at the idea that the war with America West is costing tens of millions of dollars. If it was, he asks, how come Southwest is once again reporting record profits? How do you do it? I'd like to tell you it was brilliant leadership, uh, but I really can't with a straight face. Uh, it's because we have the most productive people in the industry that are proud of what they do and the fact that they do it so well. Greetings, all you beautiful little heart throbbers and fun seekers. It may sound like outright flackery, except that Wall Street analysts say it's true. In a business where productivity equals profits, Southwest has the lowest turnover and the best labor relations in the industry, even though it's fully unionized. Salaries are comparable to other airlines, but Southwest pilots and flight attendants put in a lot more hours. They do it out of pride, profit sharing, and because they like their boss. Thank you very much. Well, I'll tell you what, give her my love, will you? Thank you, sweetie. Is the airline his life? I believe so. I think so. Thanks. I really do. He lo it's almost like a toy. He loves it. He really does. And that's why it makes us love it. Because when you're around someone that cares about it and loves it so much, it's almost like, I don't want to do anything to spoil it because he is such a good role model. Good morning, Miss Sue. Don't you look nice? At Southwest, hiring is almost a religion. 
Each employee is carefully screened for attitude, and before they start to work, they have to sit down and watch this company video that gives them an idea of what to expect. <laughs> to have an atmosphere at Southwest Airlines that makes you excited about coming to work, makes it fun to be at work. We encourage people to be individualistic, to enjoy themselves, to have a good time. Most of my color comes from urban. And once again, Herb sets the example. If you think he has fun at work, you should see him at a party. I'm just behaving myself. Do you want me, do you want me to behave better? Is that what you're telling me? Hey, who are all these turkeys back here? Huh? Each year, he throws a big bash to honor 10-year veterans. Wonderful to see you. Good to see you. I see you. You look so great. <laughs> and at the end of the evening, honors and recognition are handed out to prize employees in a ceremony that is taken just as seriously as the Oscars. I love this company. <laughs> I love our people. You know, and it, it's very simple. Uh, I love them. Uh, they kid me, uh, they make fun of me, they're irreverent towards me, they're a joy to be with. And uh, I think there's kind of a reciprocal thing going on there. They know that I love them, that I respect them, and that I'm proud of them. My name is Herb Big Daddy O. You should all know me. I run this show. Without your help, to be no left. On the ground, be lowered in the air, river. Shuffle fun, shuffle, shuffle fun, shuffle fun, fun, shuffle fun, shuffle, southwest, fun, fun. All right. So they tell us why they think they're successful. I'm not sure we have to believe them. Uh, so what I'd like uh, to ask you to do is take, uh, and this is true for everyone online as well, please take five minutes to read the case. And uh, if each of you can come up with uh, between five and ten reasons why you think Southwest is successful. And we'll try to see what we can make of it. So I'll give you five minutes to think, to read and think.
So for those of you who are physically here, if you'd like to talk with your neighbor and write down a few things, that's fine too. It's always easier to think with multiple minds than with just one. Right, let's get started. What ideas come to mind? Yes, uh, maybe one of the reasons uh, is they have a good uh, control of the operating system. All right, so um, I will repeat so that everyone can hear. So our first analysis is low operating costs. Right? What else? Anything else? It is thanks to software and it's very low cost software. So, okay. So, um, distinctive offer. All right. What else? Okay, so they use only Boeing 737s, right? They only have one type of aircraft, and all their flights are with Boeing 737s. Yes? Uh, no, let's say it's good price. Good price? Yes. Okay, so I'll translate it to attractive price. Right. What else? What are some of the things they tell us? Or they offer a single, a single class service. Yes. So single class. There's no business class, no first class, only one class of service. Yes. I'm not sure I got that. Ah, so basically they cover all the U.S. That is true. And even recently international, but yes, what else? Um, more um, uh, frequent uh, flights with less... Um, uh, turnaround time. Turnaround. Yeah. Yes, so short turnaround. And I hope it's clear enough in the case. Turnaround time is the moment between when the plane l arrives and people can start getting off and when the plane leaves and goes on to take off. And actually the number is quite impressive because it's 15 minutes between when the plane arrives and the plane leaves again, whereas the average in the industry is 65. All right, what else? Uh, more flights per day. Uh, yes, so frequent flights on each route, whenever possible at least. Yes? What else? No food on board. No food. No assigned seats. No connections with other airlines, that is true. Uh, using uh, less than just the airport? Yes, so they go to secondary airports. This doesn't work very well. We'll try something better. Yes, secondary airports. Okay. What kind of, uh, are they punctual? 
Yes, so they have very on, good on-time performance. Okay, so could we see a good corporate culture, atmosphere, if you want to call it? Yes? Let me add good corporate culture. Let me do good corporate culture. Can you say anything about the founder? Yes, so I guess the word that comes to mind is charismatic. Right. There's a charismatic leader. Anything else? I don't know if it's uh, maybe as a result, but the, uh, the customer survey could lead to uh, having some benefit impact on the marketing directly. What do you mean? I mean by having uh, customers that are always, you know, um, let's say happy. Ah. And so actually it is true. They have very satisfied customers or high customer satisfaction less cooperation with the agency and more online uh, yes so more direct sales so people go directly either to the website now but in the old days would phone the airline before internet okay And what is the most unusual aspect of their operation? So let me add something, is that they have point-to-point -point flights. No, no okay. Right, no hub and spoke is the word, right? If I want to fly from Bordeaux to uh, Chengdu in China, and I ask Air France when their next flight between Bordeaux and Chengdu is. They say, sorry, there is none. You have to go through Paris and through Shanghai. And Paris is a hub, and Shanghai is a hub for one of their partners in China. Point to point versus what is called hub and spoke. All right, let me stop here. Now is the really important question, and all of you online, I'd like you to think about it as well. Why did I write everything that came up in three different columns? In particular, let's forget about the third column. Why did I separate what is in the first column and what is in the second column? Wrong answer. It is not business strategy and corporate strategy. It's all business strategy, right? This company is competing in the airline business with other airlines. It's all business strategy. But what is the difference between the first column and the second column? Sorry? Decision. You're not wrong. Let me put it that way. Let's think. What if I bump into the CEO of Air France or American Airlines or any airline in the world and I say, oh, I figured out how Southwest does to be successful. They have low costs. Instead of leaving their planes parked at the airport all day long, they actually turn them around and fly them more hours. And you know what? They're really very good at being on time. And their customers are very happy. And uh, they don't pay high commissions to travel agents. So you, Air France, American Airlines, British Airways, whoever you want, I know how you could improve your performance. All you need to do is lower your costs, make your customers more satisfied, be more on time, and uh, try to avoid unnecessarily paying commissions to travel agents. What would any CEO of an airline tell me if I gave that advice? What would they say? 
how do we do it, right? What they would say before they, that's if they're very polite and very respectful. What they would probably say is, I already know. Let me push it further. I'd like to argue that you can always explain the success of a company by the fact that it has low costs, good products or good services, and satisfied customers. I've never heard anyone tell me our company is successful because our costs are very high, our customers are very unhappy, and our products are really bad. What does it mean? It means that what we are doing here is we're in fact detailing what is inseparable from performance. It's not possible to have good performance at the company level, at least over a certain period of time, without having something that looks like this. The particular vocabulary here is specific to airlines, but just by changing the words a little bit, it could be true for an automobile company, for a hotel chain, for pretty much anything. And I'd like to argue that everything we've put in here is actually an outcome. If the company is successful, and in any case, it should be an objective of pretty much any company. So how is that different from the first column? What is the first column? What is everything in the first column? Try again. I would not say decision, but it's Very good. It is that. Everything here is a decision. Another way of saying it is a choice. As an airline, any airline can choose to have just one type of airplanes, or two, or three, or ten, or twelve. I don't know how many different airplane models are available. But that's a management choice. Any airline can choose to price high, low, medium. It's a choice. Every airline can choose to have just one class, can choose to have two classes, can choose to have three classes. If they wanted, they could even have more. It's probably absurd, but it's a possibility. Every company can choose to have just one flight a month, or can have 12 flights a day or more. Again, it's a choice. Food, no food, is a choice. Assigned seats, again, is a choice. Not assigning seats is also a choice. And we can keep going. Why is this very different? Nothing here is a choice. You can try to make your costs as low as possible but you don't choose the cost level that you achieve. You try to build it in order for it to be as low as possible. If companies could choose their costs, what would their costs be? What should their costs be? Zero, of course, right? If you could choose the costs independently from everything else, you would choose the lowest possible costs and the most satisfied customers. This is a little more tricky. What is the third column? Let me just take one, and I realize I forced you to write it on the board. The charismatic leader. How do we know a leader is charismatic? Or when do we decide that the CEO of a company is a charismatic leader? When the company is? I would argue, when the company is successful. How do we know a company has a good corporate culture? <coughs> because the company is successful. How do we know what we call the atmosphere is a good atmosphere? Well, maybe because people look happy, but also because the company is successful. So I'd like to argue, and this is one of the pitfalls that we need to be both conscious of and careful about in strategy. I would argue that everything here is what we call a tautology. 
and I would like to add a tautology of my own. Why is Southwest successful? Because, and I'll write it in red, they have a good, what's the name of our program? Strategy. Strategy. Why do I call, so for those of you who might not be familiar with the vocabulary in logic, this is a term from logic, the science of logic. Uh, a tautology is when you basically are saying two things that are the same and trying to argue that one is the consequence of the other. So I'll give you a few examples of tautologies. How do you know that, why is someone rich? If you answer because they have a lot of money, it's a tautology. If you say, why is someone healthy? And you answer because they're not sick, it's a tautology. It's not a causal relationship. You make it sound like a causal relationship, but in fact you're just saying the same thing with a different word. And if I take the example of the charismatic leader, we say uh, the leader is charismatic because the company is successful, and we explain the fact that the company is successful by assuming that the leader is charismatic. Obviously, how do we know that a strategy is good? Because the company is successful. But why, what we can always assume is that successful companies have good strategies. But in presenting things like this, we don't understand what's going on. And what I'd like to argue is what we want to do, in fact, is we want to focus on the choices and we want to understand the logical connection between the choices and the outcomes that any company should be seeking. And it might take on different attributes in different industries. Different companies might sort of formulate these objectives more precisely. But we want to list these things, identify these choices, and understand how they cause the outcomes that in this case we're judging as positive outcomes. Why am I saying this? Because I think strategy appears to be very intuitive. It looks like, with a bit of common sense, there's no reason why we can't figure it out. And I'm not arguing that common sense isn't important. But what I'm saying is I think it's very important to be disciplined and identify maybe some of the shortcomings in our own reasoning when we think about strategy. One of the biggest pitfalls is actually the tautologies. I see managers in companies talk to each other using these, to, to, these kinds of tautologies very frequently. And I think one of the most important things if we want to have a meaningful discussion in strategy is actually to start from what people very often don't even dare mention because they think it's too down to earth to be part of strategy. But strategy, in fact, is those very basic decisions that the company makes, but that somehow are the causing mechanisms or the causing factors of the outcomes that we're seeking. Now let's push it a little bit further. Why is it that Southwest can choose to have only one type of airplane? when most airlines have multiple types of airplanes? Maintenance well, that's the consequence. So we could add maintenance costs here, right? And we can see the logical connection that there is. If you have only one type of airplane, we would need to check, but at least intellectually, it seems logical that the maintenance costs are going to be lower, right? But the question is, why? Actually, let me step back one second. Why do we think it's good for Southwest? So I'm going to build on your comment. Why do we think it's good for Southwest to have only one type of airplane? One obvious reason is maintenance costs. Which is an objective that any airline would see as desirable to keep your maintenance costs as low as possible within the same objective of safety that you have to stick to. Let's see, what's the big advantage of having a single class? It's 
Yes, it's much easier to manage. Yes. Yes. Okay. So easier to manage and make. Let's call it maintenance here. It's much simpler, much cheaper, maybe even faster, which eventually will translate into cost. Let's take another. What's the advantage of not serving food? That's easy, right? It's the cost of not only the food itself, but the logistics, the weight, the time, the space, the service. So there, we could go into details. There are lots of cost advantages to not serving food. And obviously, we have to find something positive to everything here, because otherwise, it can't explain the success of the company. What's the advantage of point to point against hub and spoke? As a passenger, do we prefer flying direct or do we prefer having to change flights somewhere? Oh, it, so clearly there's a customer satisfaction element here. So if it's so wonderful to fly point to point, to not serve food, to have a single class, to have only B737s, what should happen? We're arguing that these are wonderful decisions. What should happen then? So I don't know if I tell you uh, having one aspirin a day will make you live 200 years. What will the entire world end up doing after a few weeks, assuming I'm right? Having an aspirin, right? One every day. So what should happen? All airlines should do it, right? If it's such a good idea. So what are we missing? You don't seem convinced, and you're right. What are we missing? And I won't write in blue anymore. Is it every single decision here has advantages and, and disadvantages, right? Not serving food, what is, it, what is bad about not serving food? Passengers are hungry. So it's customer satisfaction goes down. When I'm on a plane, I always prefer food than no food. I might not eat it, but I at least look at it, I examine it, I autopsy it, and I decide if I want to eat it or not. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, but I prefer getting food. What's the disadvantage of having a single class? You lose a lot of revenues. Business class is where the margins are high. What's the huge disadvantage of having only one type of airplane? What do you lose? Well, obviously, it limits the routes you can service. So if you want to go New York to Paris, it's a slight problem. Passengers will have to pedal on the end of the flight, right? Not a very practical option. Actually, it's even a problem in terms of size because early in the morning or late in the afternoon, you would want a big plane. In the middle of the day, there are less passengers, so you want a smaller plane. You lose a lot of flexibility. And so Southwest always has to fly a 737, even if there are too many customers or too little customers. They can't adjust the size. If they want to go further, they have to make a stop to refuel, which is not practical, and so on and so forth. So now let's think. Why is it that it makes more sense for Southwest to make this choice than it does for Singapore Airlines? Because what kind of routes does Southwest fly? Contrary to Singapore Airlines. Singapore Airlines goes to Australia from Singapore, goes to America from uh, Singapore. Sorry? 
it's national, but actually maybe and it goes together. I would argue what is more important than the fact that it's national is that it's short flights. What's the average flying time of a Southwest flight? One hour. One hour and five minutes is the average. What are these? Short flights. So there's a connection between having one type of airplane and having short flights. Let's see another connection. If you were flying hub and spoke, what kind of airplanes would you not only need but want? To fly from Bordeaux to Paris, what kind of a plane would you want? Small, like a 737. But going from Paris to New York or Paris to Shanghai, what kind of an airplane would you want? Actually, a 737 can't do it. You want a very big plane. So if you fly hub and spoke, you definitely can't have just one type of airplane. It would be completely absurd. Right? So there's a connection here. Excuse me. Now, why do most airlines do hub and spoke? What's the big advantage? It's actually that it reduces costs, right? Because you adjust the size of the airplane to the number of passengers on many different destinations. Do we agree? Which is a bit of a paradox, because if you were to say, to give a name to the kind of airline that Southwest is, what would you say? It's a low-cost airline. Yet, they don't make the traditional choice that most airlines make to lower their cost. They actually choose the more expensive options in general that's called point to point. But when is it that hub and spoke really reduces costs? It's actually when you're serving medium-sized cities that are very far apart. Why? Because you take these people from medium-sized cities to a hub, then from there you fly them to another hub, and then you disperse them to medium-sized cities at the other end. If the only thing you're doing is point-to-point, -point, I mean is short-haul flights, then point-to-point -point is probably a better option. So short flights is also connected to point-to-point. -to -point. But if you're flying point-to-point, -point, maybe secondary airports are a good deal because you don't care about connections that much. Actually, you don't make connections. So why should you pay to get a much bigger, much more congested airport that happens to be much more expensive to be able to do this? So actually point to point, secondary airports, no connections. Uh, why can they not serve food? That's an easy one. Yes, because it's short haul and, and it's a single class. If you had a business class, it would be difficult not to serve anything. Right? And we can keep going. What do we see? Actually, why can they not assign seats? Also, because they have a single class. If you have multiple classes, you at least need to assign people to the class that they've paid for. Otherwise, it makes no sense. What are we saying here? What we're saying is that these choices are not random. It's not just the CEO's preference on type of airplane, on secondary airports. It's that there's a consistency between all these decisions. You make all these decisions in a fairly consistent way. And what I think is most important is that this consistency, it enhances the advantages of the decision and it minimizes the downsides of these decisions. If we take the example of point-to-point -point versus hub and spoke, the advantage of point-to-point -point is customer satisfaction. When do you really not want to have to change planes to get to your destination is actually if your destination is not very far away. If you're flying from Bordeaux to Geneva and you have to change planes in Paris, you might as well drive a car. You want a direct flight. If you're flying from Paris to Sydney, and you have to change planes in Singapore, you might actually like it because you can get off the plane, you can walk around, you can avoid a blood clot in your system. Uh, there are all sorts of benefits. Now, if we think of the disadvantage, 
of flying point to point, which is the cost, actually flying through Paris to go to Geneva is not going to create a big cost advantage. It's going to create a big disadvantage in terms of customer satisfaction and not, not that much of a cost advantage. But if you're going from Bordeaux to Chengdu in China, then the cost advantage of flying hub and spoke is very big. Why? Because having a direct plane that would go from Bordeaux to Chengdu, it would be half empty, and I'm optimistic. There would probably be three people in the plane every week, and uh, it would be a very expensive per passenger flight. And so I think consistency here is what allows the company, so everyone knows that there are advantages and disadvantages to all these decisions. What consistency does is it boosts the advantages and it decreases the disadvantages in the particular, what we could call a business system, the company is, created, is creating through these choices. So I guess another way I'm going to represent the same thing, and I guess we need to move on, otherwise we'll be here all night. Oops. I'm just going to represent exactly the same thing. What we're saying is what we have tried to identify is all these decisions that Southwest makes and trying to see how these decisions have to create at least some consistency, which is these arrows that obviously means, I don't know, single class service, no meals, uh, uncongested airports, no hub and spoke system, um, and so on and so forth. Now let me push it a little further. I'd actually like to argue that the advantages that we've listed in the middle column come from this. So we can find the maintenance costs you mentioned, the on-time performance. Why? Because it's much easier to be on time if you're flying direct flights than if you fly hub and spoke. If you fly hub and spoke, one delayed flight is going to have far-reaching consequences in your entire system. Uh, direct flight in its own right is an advantage. Less flying time. Why? Because they fly to uncongested airports. So instead of going round in circles and lining up to take off or land, well, you can land directly. Shorter turnaround time. Why shorter turnaround time? What contributes to shorter turnaround time? I would argue no meals. Why? You don't have to load the food. You don't have to clean the plane so much. You don't, uh, uh, the fact that they, there are no assigned seats, people rush into the plane to be next to the window or next to the aisle, and it's a good way to speed up operations. They have lower landing fees and lower service costs, and we could continue going, lower booking costs, and on and on. Right? So again, what are we saying? We're saying we need to distinguish the outcomes from the decisions, and we need to think about how the consistency of these choices creates the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. Right? Now, I'd like to argue that all this is speculation at this point. And what we want to try to see is, can we measure some of these effects? So I'd like to argue that at least on the cost side, it's much simpler than it seems. And so, I'd like to argue that strategy is not that difficult, but we need discipline. We need to know what we're looking for. So actually, in the case you've read, there are very easy cost advantages to calculate. They're landing fees. On average, they pay $5 per passenger instead of 14 at the major airports. It means they save $9 per passenger, and as they fly 135 million passengers a year, it's over a billion dollars. It looks like nothing, but it adds up to a fair amount of money. The reservations, the computerized reservations, we didn't list it, but we should have. Why, don't, why can they afford not to be in systems like Sabre, Apollo, Amadeus? Because they don't make connections. These systems are particularly useful to make your flights connect with someone else's flights. 
if you're not making connections, there's no point paying the fee to be in these systems because the system is never going to transfer passengers onto you. You'll probably not even be at the same airport. Again, it saves $800 million. The travel agent fees we talked about, well, they only have 15% of their reservations through travel agents when the average in the industry is about 50, despite internet and everything else. Uh, again, $600 million. Fuel, just because you spend less time in the air, another $600 million. Meals, we didn't have a number in the case, but I'm sure that once you build in the logistics and all the costs, it has to be at least $5 per passenger. A bad sandwich at a fast food place costs at least $5 or close to $5. Again, $600 million. And then most important of all is the aircraft utilization. Uh, I won't go through all the calculations, but they have 500 aircraft. They make 5,000 trips a day. It means 10 trips a day per aircraft. And we can break it down. Each aircraft flies on average 65 minutes multiplied by 10 flights and it may be distributed differently across the fleet but on average that's it. There are nine intervals for which each one is 15 minutes, the turnaround time. It means that their planes can operate between, I don't know, 6 in the morning and 8 at night or something like that, uh, around 13 hours a day. Why? Because on short haul flights, nobody wants to leave at 2 in the morning or arrive at 1 in the morning. People want to leave at more uh, decent times. But to fly exactly the same system, the average airline would need 65 minutes flying time plus the 20% of time wasted because of congestion. And instead of the 15 minute turnaround time, they would need 55 minutes, which is the average turnaround time in the industry. It means for each flight, an average airline needs 133 minutes, give or take a few minutes, it doesn't matter. What does it mean? It means that if you try to put in flights that last 133 minutes in 13 hours, more or less you can fly six flights a day during those 13 hours, if you're a normal airline flying with the normal performance of the industry. That's instead of 10. What does it mean? It means a normal airline, just to fly exactly the same program as Southwest, would need, need over 800 aircraft, where Southwest needs only 500. And we can calculate the cost. The cost of an aircraft is 70 million and lasts about 20 years. It means that the total cost is again over a billion dollars, and I think that's a conservative figure. If we put it all together, it means Southwest has at least a 30% cost advantage. Why at least? Because there are lots of things that we haven't accounted for in this calculation. Now what does Southwest do with this cost advantage? Who gets it? I would argue. Part of it goes into lower fares, so the prices, and we mentioned, attractive fares, so the passengers get some of the benefits, but who get the other benefits? Well, obviously the shareholders in the form of profits and dividends and stock price, when we saw the stock price going up. So again, this is the system, and what I'd like to argue is that ultimately everything we had listed as an outcome boils down to two things. It boils down to lower costs, so it may be operating costs, it may be maintenance costs, it may be fuel costs, we can calculate the costs we want, and we didn't calculate it, but probably there is some element of it, is higher what we'll call willingness to pay, which is the value that is created for the customer. How is it that the customer gets more value, irrespective of the price, if they choose to fly Southwest than another airline. Now they don't get more value on everything, but they do get more on time performance and so on, and we want to uh, collect that. And I'd like to argue that when we're thinking about business strategy, we always want to think about how the decisions we make affect either cost or willingness to pay. If a decision does not affect cost or willingness to pay, it's not a strategy decision. 
There is no point talking about what color they paint their planes. It is a choice, but the brown paint they have is probably the same cost as pink or green or yellow, and I don't think passengers will pay more or less money because the plane is brown. So basically, let the employees choose, let the passengers have a vote, whatever, or flip a coin, it makes no difference at all. So what can we learn from the case? The first thing I'd like to point out is that every single choice we listed has advantages and disadvantages. What would happen if it had only advantages? We argued it. Every company in the industry would make the same choice. If every company in the industry makes the same choice, it's no longer a choice. It's an industry standard. I'll give you one example. Is it a good idea to put four wheels on automobiles? The answer is yes. It's better than three wheels and it's better than five wheels. But if I say my strategy is to put four wheels on every car, I won't be the CEO of an automobile company for very long. Why? Because it's so obvious that everyone has figured it out, that it's an obviously good choice, and it has become an industry standard. What does it mean? It means that companies have to agree when they're looking at strategic choices. They're, they need to accept that there is some disadvantage and some risk associated with that. And I think that's very difficult for companies to do. Uh, when I've seen strategy decisions being made, if someone comes up with an idea and someone else can find a disadvantage, the idea immediately gets pushed off the table. And I would argue, no, we should actually confront the point of view that argues for that choice with the point of view that argues against the choice. The more we get all the arguments on both sides, the more we will understand both the advantages and the disadvantages and we will be able to think about how to maximize the advantages and minimize the disadvantages. Let's assume we wanted to make a car with three wheels. The obvious disadvantage is stability, but maybe if we chose to make only an automobile for, I don't know, urban circulation, it becomes less of an issue, and the disadvantages are less, and we could find other consistencies, and that would be a real choice that departs from the standard in the industry. That's what we need to be talking about. The second argument is that all this is relevant to us in strategy, in business strategy, if it has an impact on either cost or willingness to pay. So we should always, I feel like saying almost obsessively, be thinking about why is it that if we do this, our costs will come down? Or why is it that if we do this, customers, most customers, will be more likely to pay a higher price. And I think we would realize that companies make many decisions where the customer couldn't care less and costs don't really come down. That is typically what happens with over-engineered, over-sophisticated offerings and these kinds of situations. The third idea is that the success of a company very rarely comes from just one thing. It's not this one decision that someone made that drives success. It's actually a system, and consistency in the system becomes a crucial ingredient. So even if we wanted to understand the success of iPhone, it would be difficult to boil it down to just one thing. Is it iOS? I'm not sure. Is it the touch screen? Even at the beginning, I'm not sure. Is it the brand? Maybe. Is it uh, design? Probably. I think more importantly, all this is done in a consistent way. Why? Because iOS is going to be more expensive than Android, because Apple has to pay for the development of iOS, whereas Android is quasi-free, or is very low uh, licenses. Uh, because of that, the price has to be high, therefore design has to be more careful, and the brand has to be cultivated. The third idea is that even if you made these choices, there's no guarantee that you will be able to perform the way Southwest does. Organizationally, it's going to be difficult to put it together, to get it to work in the right way. And there's a lot of trial and error, 
And this is what we will cover in part when we talk about strategy implementation. It means that the organization has to be set up to actually extract the best of the system that has the multitude choices that have been made. It also means, for example, the incentive system for employees has to drive behaviors that will optimize the benefits of these choices, and so on and so forth. And finally, we also need to realize that any competitive advantage we can create, any system we set up, is also a constraint. Each time you try to expand, you potentially undermine the value of your system. So when, if Southwest tries to fly two-hour flights, obviously it can. If it starts flying three-hour flights, maybe not serving meals is a bit more of a problem. Actually, their longest flight before their international routes was four hours and a half. Clearly, people might get hungry after four hours and a half. They need to deal with it. They could either serve meals on an exceptional basis, or they could warn people to bring their own sandwiches, but then cleaning the plane becomes a problem. So there is a problem associated, or there is a constraint associated with expansion. As you expand, you potentially at least undermine your competitive advantage. So let me argue that business strategy is a thought process. The, the objective of business strategy is to create some form of competitive advantage. And why do we need this competitive advantage, which we haven't defined very well yet, but in fact we have, is because we want to achieve maximum profitability, at least of above average profitability. We want to be more profitable than other companies in the same business. And there are only two ways I can think of being more profitable. One is to have lower costs. The other is to have higher prices. And that's why willingness to pay on the one hand, cost on the other, is such a critical outcome of any strategy. And obviously, the relationship between the two is complicated. Each time you want to increase willingness to pay, you first have to increase costs. And each time you try to cut costs, you're very likely going to reduce willingness to pay. And if a manager finds out that willingness to pay can be increased without increasing costs, you should immediately fire that manager. Why? Because that manager should have done it long time ago without even talking to you about it. It's an obvious choice. The only strategy choice is if you want to increase willingness to pay, but realize that you also need to increase costs to do that. And the question then is, can we increase willingness to pay more than proportionally or vice versa? But again, this idea that we want to focus on cost and willingness to pay is a critical component of business strategy. Again, I would argue that strategy is really about fairly down-to-earth decisions. And one useful tool that we'll talk about in the course is what we call the value chain. And the value chain tells you everything that needs to be done. What are all the activities we need to carry out to make an automobile, to carry people in an airline, to make software, whatever. And we want to break it down. And we want to see what are the options on each of these activities, and how can we create a consistent system that is going to give us an advantage in terms of cost or willingness to pay. So that will be one, one segment of the course is going to be on analyzing these different topics. Let me argue finally that with this objective of competitive advantage, how do we look at it? And this is where we will start the course tomorrow morning, if you want to do it tomorrow morning, but at least this week is that part of what we're talking about is actually constrained, determined by features in the industry that we're talking about. So what we can do and not do in airlines is determined by the fact that airlines have certain drivers of costs, certain drivers of value, certain constraints, including legal constraints, have to solve certain problems, and that is going to determine the range of things that we can even start thinking about. So for example, theoretically, 
or technically it's possible to reduce costs by reducing the level of safety. But it's not a choice that airlines can make because there's a legal constraint on the safety uh, regulations and decisions you need to abide by. Therefore, if you want to reduce costs, you need to do something else. You can't really reduce fuel costs very easily because you buy your aircraft from manufacturers. These aircraft use, use fuel. It's not under your decision. You can't tell the pilot to switch off the airline for or the engine for a while while they're flying. And those are constraints that are determined by this. If you're selling ice cream, your business is ice cream, well, there's a big problem to be solved, is it has to arrive to the final customer cold. It's a constraint. Unless you find a way to keep it cold all the way to the final customer, it's not called ice cream anymore. Now, in this context, what is it that we as a company have that allows us to make slightly different choices from other um, competitors? And how does it result in a competitive advantage? And this has to do with what we have, what we don't have, our skills, our history, our preferences, what people know how to do, what they don't know how to do inside the company. But if we find a good idea, we immediately need to check why we believe competitors will not be able to just copy our idea immediately. If it's very easy for competitors to copy, it doesn't mean we don't want to do it, but we don't want to bet the future of the company just on those choices. And this has to do with things like the likely reactions of competitors. For example, Air France is probably not going to copy Southwest's model. They don't want to. Uh, is imitation easy or difficult? Is there any first mover advantage? If there's a first mover advantage and you do it first, well, maybe you can at least keep that advantage for a while. But eventually, all these competitors will react. And as they react, the industry itself will change. And we'll need to start this whole process over and over again. I'd even like to argue we should never stop this process. It should be an ongoing thought process to try to understand both why we're successful and how we can try to be even more successful. So let me just say one word about implementation. This is just what we've talked about. Essentially, when we talk, in this case, about business strategy, we're trying to see how the company can deal with constraints coming from its external environment in order to create a competitive advantage. But we also need to figure out how it is that what the company owns, has internally, is going to make this strategy possible. And what do we mean by internal context? We mean, of course, the people. So how long have they been in the company? How are they trained? How motivated are they? What is their behavior, their psychology, all sorts of things? And when we move from one person to many people, there are cultural elements that come into place. Obviously, leadership matters. So leadership can get people to do things that other leaders or not so good leaders might not be able to do. But at the same time, what conditions a lot of this is what kind of an organization we set up. Do people work in little teams that are very autonomous? Do they work in very large groups that are bureaucratic? What kind of processes do we have? Are people allowed to make decisions at their own level or do they have to get permission? What kind of incentive systems? What are people rewarded on? What are they punished on? And depending on all this, the company will be more or less able to do something. I would like to argue that these elements is what we call firm capabilities. And these capabilities come from the way in which we have created an organizational culture and we have set up a structure and processes that fit our strategy. That's why, I don't know, if Mercedes-Benz decided they wanted to compete with Tata tomorrow morning, it's not that it's absurd. I don't know if it is or not, but certainly they wouldn't be able to do it because everything inside the company goes in another direction. And if Tata wants to be Jaguar tomorrow, they better buy Jaguar and keep it separate because what Tata is originally is not going to lead to the creation of a Jaguar type brand and products anytime soon. Okay. So I'm just going back to this triangle. 
and I'll tell you where we are going to go over the next few weeks. So the first um, couple of weeks we will talk about the industry, what we need to identify in the industry, understand in the industry. We'll talk about the value chain which I presented a while ago and we'll try to see what are some of the major choices that companies can make in terms of strategy. Then in uh, the, uh, the third and fourth week we'll talk about what we call firm resources which has in part to do with these organizational elements but also it can be know-how and so on and we will think about competitive dynamics how can we expect companies to interact with each other in a competitive way within a given industry and we'll talk more about innovation strategies and in particular about a topic that is business model innovation how can companies reconfigure their business model to try to derive advantages that ultimately translate into lower cost or higher willingness to pay and if possible both so that's where we're going with the next four weeks and I'd like to open it up we're already very late but I don't know if you have any questions or more details on anything, either practical or whatever. No questions? No questions from the room? All right. And this is our next steps. So today, today, right? Yes, yes, today or tomorrow? I'm lost. Today. Uh, all the material for week number one has been released. So each course is pretty much four weeks in general. Uh, we'll release week two, then we'll have what we call a consulting coffee uh, webinar for those who are interested. It's either if you want to sort of try to apply some of the ideas that we're going to be talking about or if you have a particular issue in your own company or if there's a company you're interested in you'd like to discuss their strategy. That's what we do in this consulting coffee. So it's with all participants and with one or two coaches and uh, we have one next week I believe and uh, so I'll be happy to give you any opinions they're not necessarily good opinions but I'll give you my view on a number of topics that you might bring up then we'll continue uh, releasing the material we'll have another live session to try to go in to a sort of a more interactive application of some of the concepts that we will have discussed in the first three weeks then we'll have the fourth week, another consulting coffee, and then uh, luckily for you, you'll see a lot of me at the beginning, but then new faces will come in as we go along. So there will be my colleague Laurence Lehmann who will come in. Uh, she'll talk more about business model innovation. And finally, by mid-March, we'll have the course exam, which I'm sure you're all terrified by at this point. And we will ask you to also grade that in exam through this peer review uh, process. So that's where we're going and uh, I apologize we took a little bit longer. But it was, I think some of these ideas are so commonsensical that trying to provide them in writing as a, as a conference make. If I had told you we have to separate a cause and an effect, you would tell me of course I knew that, why am I wasting my time here? But I think that when we try to do it, our normal thought process leads us to mix all these things together and that it requires a fair amount of discipline and being conscious of this to be able to separate it. Maybe some of you were expecting a lot of strategy jargon. So every six weeks there's a new book that tells you how companies will be successful in the next 50 years. Luckily a lot of it is tautology. And so all these books, I think, can't give you a valid recipe. Why? Because if there were a recipe and it worked, what would happen? So if I wrote a book that was a miracle strategy that worked for every single company in the world, what would happen? I would be very rich, but I should run away fast because once every company in the world applies my recipe, my recipe becomes valueless. Why? Because what we're talking about is competitive interaction and differential performance. And by definition, no recipe can be universal and forever. So in that sense, it is very different from, say, engineering, where there is an optimal technical solution at a given point in time. 
in strategy there can be no optimal solution. It's all relative and all competitive. Okay. So thank you for coming to listen. Thank you for connecting. And uh, well, I hope we'll have fun. That's the main objective. And I hope that uh, the program will answer some of your questions or at least uh, fill some of your uh, expectations and uh, we'll get many opportunities to talk more about it. So thank you very much. Amandine, anything else? We're all done? Okay, thank you. Mute.